Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Melcher and I'm the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit and I'd like to welcome you to today's Future of Storytelling speaker series. Uh, this series and the summit itself are devoted to better understanding how technology is impacting and changing the way we tell stories in the broadest sense of the word. Through the power of Google Plus Hangouts, we bring our summit speakers back to lead weekly roundtable conversations in this open forum. Uh, this week, we're very delighted to have with us Alexis Lloyd. Hi, Alexis. Nice to see you. Hi, Charlie. Uh, so Alexis is the creative director of the Research and Development Lab at the New York Times, uh, where she investigates technology trends and prototypes future concepts for content delivery. Her work is focused on creating immersive and exploratory experiences through innovative physical to digital interactions, data visualizations, and screen-based interfaces. She was a speaker with us at FOST in, uh, this last October, and in addition to being a speaker, helped to uh, organize an original exhibition as part of our Story Arcade exhibit, uh, which was a wonderful um, Internet of Things uh, hands-on e exhibition. So we really thank you for that and for participating today. So welcome. My pleasure. Um, so we have some other distinguished guests with us today, uh, and let me let them introduce themselves. So let's start with Lane. Hey, I'm Lane, uh, co-founder and ECD of Fake Love in New York City. How's it going? Great. <laughs> Glad to have you here, Lane. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I should say, Lane was also part of FOSS this last year where uh, we had the story, arc, uh, story crawl experience and a bunch of our attendees got to spend some time in your studio and had a great time. So thank you for, for being part of the future storytelling experience. You're welcome. Uh, uh, and Simone, as I'm supposed to say that with my hands, <laughs> introduce yourself. Please. Great. So I'm Simone Rebaudengo. I'm an interaction designer at Frog Design in uh, Munich. And I'm, I play a lot with uh, connected products. And I'm here also to, to say my part in like, what is the, how can we design new relationship between products? And so I'm very happy to be part of this panel. We're very Thanks. happy to have you part of it. Welcome. Um, so I thought maybe to kick off today's conversation, we'd start by showing a little bit of the uh, FOST film that we created with Alexis uh, for last October. So, so let's start by just showing a little clip of that. The Internet of Things refers to objects that are connected, sensing, data-enabled, things that can talk to each other and to the world around them, to the Internet at large. As objects begin to interact more with the world around them, they begin to have subjectivity. They have a point of view. We begin to think more about how this object hears, how this object sees, and we adapt our behavior in order to have a more fruitful conversation with it. So we modulate our tone of voice or change our phrasing or maybe we enunciate more. That understanding changes the way that we interact with it or changes the way that we behave in the world. And so as we start to think about this more broadly, we start to ask questions like, how does a sensor perceive a person? How does an object understand hot and cold? What does your camera see? Hmm. Nice piece. Love that film. <laughs> so, so Alexis, and I put this actually to a whole group, why don't we start by just uh, giving a, a little bit more of an insight to what you see as the meaning of the Internet of Things. It's such a buzzword today. Uh, tell us, what, what does it mean to you? So for me, I mean, I think in the film, as you just saw, I gave sort of a, a very brief definition of, you know, how objects are starting to become embedded with sensing capabilities and connected to one another so that they can transmit and receive data. Um, and that's kind of the, the base level definition. Um, when we talk about the Internet of Things more broadly and culturally now, we tend to think about, you know, the Nest thermostats and um, things like that. There are these very utilitarian things. They're about, you know, how does, my, how does my coffee pot talk to my alarm clock so that my coffee is ready when I wake up in the morning? Um, or, you know, how does my, my bracelet let me know how active I've been? Or my lamp color tell me how my stock portfolio is doing? Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think that there's a huge The answer for of... me today is not very. <laughs> <laughs> see that. Anyway, sorry. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of potential um, 
once we start connecting objects, I actually really like uh, David Rose uses the term enchanted objects. And I think there, there's something to that, or um, talking about connected objects, about enchanted objects, that um, beyond these very utilitarian functions that we start to really frame our relationship with objects differently um, as they start to sense us, as they bec become responsive and interactive. And I think, you know, this is part of a larger phenomenon that I'm seeing where we're starting to form much more conversational relationships with computational systems generally so that we understand that there are these algorithmic systems operating all around us and we start to understand them as subjects. We start to understand their point of view. So like I was saying in the film, like when you're talking to, when you're using a voice UI like on your phone and you need to mispronounce your friend's name to get it to call your friend and you, you have sort of done this impulse response to understand how it hears you and know what, how you need to pronounce that name so that it will call them and that is you're shaping your behavior to the behavior of the system. And I think that becomes doubly interesting once those systems become situated and embedded in objects that um, those objects start to be able to be participants in the world around them. They start to be able to collect data about what's happening either to them or in, in their environment. Um, and in doing so, they can sort of contain their own stories. And so the question becomes, what are those stories? And then how do we, how do we tell them? Um, do the objects tell them themselves? Do we act as kind of ventriloquists for these objects? I think there are a whole bunch of interesting possibilities there that are worth considering. Hmm. Lane, do you have anything you would like to add? I mean, when you think about the Internet of Things, did, mm -hmm. did Alexis really describe it? Yeah, I mean, I think she hit it on the nose when we start talking about the difference between what is a utility uh, object and what is an object that we have a real emotion of, emotional connection to. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people today see, like, the nest or see objects like that as a utility object and don't really see the full potential. I mean, in my head, I, we, I keep seeing Internet of Things as, like, a precursor to, to real artificial intelligence is really, I think, what we're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a great point that yeah. the adding of the emotional connection too. It's not just a, a hammer. It's something we might actually become connected to in a more profound way. Well, yeah. And sorry to interrupt. I, I think there's something interesting there that we've been talking a lot about in the lab, which is that um, what happens when we talk about robots? Because robots are always the future. Like what? Mm -hmm. Even though there are things in our present, like some of these connected objects, that you could make the argument are robots, the things we talk about as robots are always situated in the future. And so it's kind of interesting to think about that, um, that dichotomy and, and how we start to form those relationships if you think about these as AI objects. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Internet of Things is a nice word right now that we're using to, to like I was saying, a precursor to, to artificial intelligence. You know, it's, it's a nice way to ease people into that idea you know, so we say, hey, here's this object, and it might be like, like something we did at Fake Love, which is like take vintage objects and make them connected to people so they can tweet or they could send Instagram photos. And it's an easy way for people to feel like they're associated with something rather than saying, like, here's this robot who's your new best friend. And I think it's also like the, one of the main issues that we always think about these as a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So even though we're talking about connected products, we always mm -hmm. design only the relationship with the single person. And I think there is much more uh, interesting points where we start to look at, as also Alexis said, when a lot of objects are connected, and, you know, what kind of a relationship happens between them and, and how that relationship then affects the single relation with, with people. And I think it's also, I mean, I don't want to quote her, but I mean, if you all of you guys saw the movie, there is a very interesting part in which Basically, there is this connection of multiple entities talking to each other, then influencing the relationship that the single person have. So, so I think that you know, like when what, what we saw now with the Internet of Things is a lot of like um, let's say like a very long finger. So we are trying to design these apps or things that allow us to have you know these long fingers to touch some object far away. But I think that's like a very limited vision of what it could be and especially I mean going on going on with more self uh, self let's say something that has a more of a life of its own or have more relationship of its own it's something that it's more interesting to look at and and so I mean I, I want to talk about more 
uh, as Alexis said, about objects and not necessarily about internet. You know, it, I mm -hmm. think it's a, we are we are anyway designing objects and we are designing their behaviors and how their behavior evolve and how we can somehow design the relationship themselves and not necessarily the connection. I mean, connection is the first step. Then you know that's then it's the rest. It's what you do with that connection. I think we lost a yeah, exactly. little bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. It, it, this is not a perfect connection either. Um, so, so let me just ask though, uh, because I think a lot of people they they know they have sensors in their phones and they've heard of the Nest and um, but they don't quite realize I think how prevalent this is around us now that it, we're not really talking about so far in the future, are we? No, I mean, I think, sorry, <laughs> I think one, one example of this that's um, a, a great example of how of not only um, how this isn't so far in the future, but how people respond when they realize how prevalent this is, is the, um, the connected waste bins in London that were recently banned. So um, there, were, there were new trash cans installed throughout London that had um, digital screens on them and Wi-Fi connections and it was sort of, you know, Wi-Fi connection so you can put your ads on the digital screens but then very shortly after they were installed that Wi-Fi was being implemented to um, to look at all of the, the MAC addresses, the unique identifiers of every phone uh, that walked by the trash can. So it was basically doing um, pedestrian tracking and people got really up in arms about this because the waste baskets were suddenly spies and it would, you know I think that there are things like that that um, people are thinking about the technology and the utility oh we can see how many people are walking down the street without thinking about the relationships and without thinking about the implications in the social sense. Um, so I, I, this is just a good question that came in so I think we might jump to it right now from, from Natalie. Um, and she writes, this may be because I saw the movie Her, but I worry about the emotionally driven relationships we're forming to physical things. What might we lose when we rely on object driven data, not raw human imagination for our stories? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, anyway, we I have mean, a connection with the. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, we have anyway emotional relationship with physical things. It's just that what we have so far is that there is no reaction from the object. I mean, everything we do is based on our own perception of the object itself. So, you know, I don't know if you saw, there is a great movie about it's, it's uh, married to the felt, a woman married to the felt hour. I mean, there is, there are fringes of people that are anyway so in love with objects, but each of us is maybe less emotionally attached to a lot of things around us. It's just that if an object can then show back something, that's also when it becomes more complicated and interesting. The thing that's funny about her actually is that um, outside of the kind of the the AI implications and you know the virtual realities that are that are shown in the film, that um, so much of the production design of that movie is this kind of homage to um, this nostalgic version of our emotional relationship to objects. It's this, you know, very kind of like mid-century uh, industrial design and interior design that is all about kind of um, how we have this kind of create these emotional connections to, to our surroundings and to the things around us, but in a, in a non-digital sense. Yeah. I mean, we should, I think also some, some people should take a step back and realize that they spend, you know, half their day with their their neck craned over staring at their phones and our, our idea of what Internet of Things are or our relationship to these objects is, is a little more freeing and should help us to actually open up our eyes more and see the world and see real relationships and I, that's hopefully what we, what we will be doing when we create these objects and we create these relationships between myself, this object and this other object uh, somewhere else across the world and it's just tough like when I walk down the street in New York City everyone's like this you know so and those are the same people that are like, I don't want this trash can watching me, and I don't want, you know, like, I, I don't want these things like Big Brother standing over me. And they don't realize that, like, things like Google Glass and, thing, and things that are here right now are actually freeing and will actually get you physically staring at someone and talking to them. Mm -hmm. So you, you think we're ultimately going to get set free, that we're going to, this is a transitional technology, the phone and our 
need to look down into it, and, and we will just be in environments that are aware. Is that right? Like our office and our homes and our cars and the city streets will be responsive and, and be able to have us have that interaction that we don't have now or we only get now through our phone? Yeah, I mean, we all we all know that that's coming. It's been coming since you know, like, <laughs> since you know, like total recall. I mean, it's it's just, it's just it's just the nature. It's the nature of things, and it's, it's the future. And I, I mean, but I have these conversations yelling the with people where they're like, "Look at that guy wearing the Google Glass," and like, he's "Such a jerk." And you know, and I'm like, "Why?" You know, like, you know, this is this is what you're gonna be wearing next year. You know, like, so. <laughs> well, I mean, move I on. Think I think what's interesting about that is that there's a whole, and again, this is one of these things where. Um, there are a lot of cultural assumptions that go into new technologies before mm -hmm. they even become widely dispersed in the world. So we have, like, you know, our our vision of what you know that heads-up display looks like is still hugely influenced by like Terminator 2, and mm -hmm. <laughs> even though that's not what it's going to be. And so, like, if you look at those cultural assumptions, it's that you're going to be able to get the one canonical answer to whatever it is you're looking at at any time, and there are all these embedded questions in that, like, who's authoring your physical world? Is it Google? Is it the New York Times? Is it Wikipedia? You know, what are your sources? Who gets to author that? How do we interpret the signals about what someone's doing to understand what question it is they want the answer to at that moment? So mm -hmm. if I'm, you know, if I'm looking at my, my can of Diet Coke here, do I want to know how many calories it has or if I can recycle it or, you know, it, um, information about the Coca-Cola company or how it's doing on the stock market, like there's layers upon layers of, of how those technologies could be implemented and really um, gnarly questions embedded in them. That oh, yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the question is like, do you want that Coke can to know how many times you pick it up to drink it a day and to be sending that information to Coca-Cola headquarters, you know? Right, and exactly. You, um, Which, by the way, is out there every day already. I mean... I know. Yeah. You use your phone, as you use your Kindle. I mean, all of that yeah. data is collected and, and stored. So, so let okay. me take this to the. Actually, to, sorry, just sorry, one note on that, which is that there's a. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, who was talking about this? I'm not going to be able to attribute this well, but talking about the Internet of Things not being for consumers, but being um, layers of data collection for for corporate interests, like for the manufacturers, so that you can see. You know when when your line of you know refrigerators is breaking and where not so much about like a smart refrigerator being um, a particularly compelling user facing device. So I think there's a, a interesting layer about thinking about you know who it, who the Internet of Things is for and when things are designed like who it's benefiting. Yeah, um, I, I certainly had the thought about that just when Lane was talking about how many people are happy to be looking at their phones all day but annoyed by the Google Glass, and, and that has a lot to do with the value proposition, what you get from the relationship. People are so so appreciative of what they're getting from their phones that they think they're happy to give away everything <laughs> you know, in exchange for what they're getting, whereas they don't see the value proposition with the Google Glass yet. Um, but anyway, let me, let me take it to another level. So, so let's assume that, that almost all the tools and, and uh, spaces that we live in um, have some awareness, right? Have, have, are connected. And so, so what happens then? What is the conversation that starts to take place between those things uh, not just between us and those objects, but between the objects. What, how's that, what's that conversation going to be like, and, and how do you think that might end up benefiting uh, the elephant in the room, which is us? <laughs> well, I don't know. I may, I, I'll take the word on this. Uh, I, I tried to explore. I mean, I did this project la, last year. It's called Addicted Products. And, and I think the, the main question I had was, like, what, what happens if an object actually start to talk to other objects because, I mean, what would they talk about and what is their perception of the world? And so, and I mean, I started to look at the first things like being used, for instance, and how, you know, like if an object is not connected, his idea of being used is, you know, only based maybe on his own history. And, but, you know, in the moment it's connected to other, then all this reality shifts. And so it's suddenly entered in this world of re re relativity in which, you know, being used become relative to others. And then, so what I try to do is explore in a bit on a fiction, in a speculative way how then an object could change its own uh, reality by trying to get in a better place. But I think that's an interesting point. Like we never, we always design thinking about the user at the center, 
but maybe like in, in you know the next step you know we, we used to design things in order to be better understood by people because they were very complex then now we're designing things that in a way we are in this middle we then we don't know who is the real user that we design for and now probably in the future we also have to basically design from the point of view of the products because we need to understand how is this object going to you know learn change talk grow uh, so I think it's it's pretty much a very in interesting point of shifting of point of view and perspective from us that I mean we're still in in I would say command because we are the designers we are the ones that are going to put them in the world but yeah I think that's a really really good point and I think it's part of a uh, evolution we're seeing in terms of um, the rela uh, these relationships between um, people and objects and also sort of people and networks generally where um, products are designed and interfaces are designed so that we see ourselves at the center of this interaction and the, all the complexity is sort of abstracted away from us. We just see the user facing part but that there's really so much happening in the background that's not for us. You know, it's in service of corporate goals or um, you know, black markets or advertising or all sorts of other interests that aren't about the person at the center anymore. Hmm. So um, we have another question that came in, and this is one for. Yeah, it's um, like if it's oh. Copern. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Simone. Did we lose you? No, he's there. He's there. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so just to respond to this question we received from Luke, um, and it's for Alexis. And what are the examples of how the New York Times is experimenting with the Internet of Things? Um, that's a great question. It's something that we're looking at a lot in the R&D lab. There, are, um, there are projects that we've done. Uh, in the past couple of years that are about kind of um, connected environments and environmental computing, so thinking about when you want digital information and content flowing into your physical spaces. So we built um, uh, two, three years ago now, like a connected um, bathroom mirror, um, and we last year built an exploration of how you um, interact with recipes in a sort of situated kitchen objects, kitchen counter kind of thing. Um, more recently, we've been looking at, uh, and this gets to Simone's point about sort of looking at individuals versus groups or communities. Um, we've been exp using um, a browser extension amongst our group in the lab that basically does uh, a semantic analysis of every uh, website that each of us visits, but anonymously. Um, so for the group as a whole, we have this stream of topics and that we've been um, reading about, and it's sort of this interest stream, like what we've been what we've been reading about, what we've been exposed to over the past several days, and we've been been exploring ways that that um, sort of digital stream of attention and topics starts to um, find its way into the physical world. So one of my colleagues, Noah Fian, um, made a, a project called Blush, which is a wearable that um, that listens to the the in-person conversation you're having and anytime someone mentions one of those keywords or topics that's been in our kind of group's recent um, browser history um, it'll glow, it'll sort of form a punctuation to that in-person conversation with your, your bringing your online interests into your offline interactions. Hmm. So interesting, that's very cool. I mean, you think about all of the data that um, or all the information that we exchange when we have a conversation for example, through hand gesture, or through intonation, or or micro expressions, and to think about having technology augment that sort of nonverbal information, I think is a really unique idea. I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, and it's it's something we're exploring also because it's um, looking at kind of the flip side of of privacy being intimacy. So thinking about how things that could easily, if, if that were implemented in another way, um, that could easily feel like surveillance, but because it's so intimate and it's for our group and it's the right degree of anonymity, um, it feels like intimacy. It feels like it gives us a signal into uh, what's going on with our, our colleagues rather than feeling like we're being spied on, which is it's an interesting balance to, to find. 
thus the name blush, right? The, yes. <laughs> I, I think that's. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I think it's a very interesting point because the we we we're kind of there is always this scary. I mean, now it's incredible. In Ger for instance, now I'm in Germany and everyone is so scared about privacy data, and pro I don't know even more the U.S. But it's it's pretty interesting that we. We need to find a way to 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 change this by by creating new values and 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 I think to, through design the objects differently or through design the interaction differently that's the only way we can do that and because anyway there is always going to be some kind of company or corporation owning some of this data but it's about finding the way of making this valuable and not making it uh, and making it visible or making it more interesting or and because I mean at the moment as you said also earlier Charles there is no there is no value yet, and it's uh, it feels like we're just doing it for the sake of giving uh, giving data. Which I, I'm really interested in that because I do feel that a lot of the information that's being recorded right now mm -hmm. uh, is not stuff I really care about. It's not that compelling to me. Okay, so you know my refrigerator tells me that I'm out of orange juice. Uh, okay, I can look in the refrigerator and know I'm out of orange juice. I mean, I guess I'm just saying. What are the what are the messages? What are the the stories and information that we can hope to eventually receive? That's going to really be valuable to us. Where do you guys think this is headed in a way that will be profound in, instead of just sort of because um, we can do it? I mean, I, for me, I think it, it has to do with more of a, more about creativity and and less about get our stuff getting funded through corporations and advertising. You know, so like for us, like. We're, it's always about like what kind of story we want to tell at the beginning, and and how to like how one creative or one artist can talk to another. It's not for us about like how we can get information from you know like or data from one thing to another. It's about like I'm I'm a creative here in New York. How do I speak to a creative in Munich in a new way? Something that we can't just do on the phone, or something that we can't just do on a hangout. What is a new way we can do that? And and. What and if there's an object in between us, what is that object bringing to the table creatively? What is it adding? Not like how is it connecting A to B, but what is it adding to the creative situation? Um, and hopefully, you know, between all, all of us and people on the panel and, and people like us, we can figure that out and actually like get some real value out of what we're doing instead of just someone saying, "Here is a hundred thousand dollars from." You know, X corporation build this thing for me that, you know, talks talks to me and sends me information. But I think I, I mean one other. Oh, sorry. No, no, one no, other no. point that is uh, is that I mean maybe we think of this too central in our life as well because mm -hmm. uh, there is, there is a lot of project for instance like I really love the vision that Berg was giving like some years ago about you know uh, sleepy screen in our life and what do they do and you know they're connected they receive data. But they're not necessarily central to our life. It's just something mm -hmm. that adds a layer, maybe of complexity, of information. But I mean, a lot of the the messaging with Internet of Things is that it needs to be central or valuable. But maybe I mean, our life will not change that much. It's it's just about creating a a little bit of difference here and there. Where you know, if uh, if my if my screen is listening to the radio, maybe they will you know start to interact with each other. But that maybe will not even be something I will care of, but still it's going to be bringing some sort of value somewhere. I think we're also very much in the, the, the first nascent phase of the Internet of Things where um, we're, most of what we're doing is we're measuring things that we can easily measure and then showing measurements back to people, um, which isn't really that compelling an interaction. Um, Maybe in some cases it is. Maybe in the case of something like a Fitbit, it gives you some visibility over time into something that you had no way of really looking at before. But um, for the most part, just you know, quantification and then displaying that quantification back to a user is not a, a compelling interaction. So it's you know, first of all, I think the question is how do we start to um, measure things that aren't as easily measurable? So we're thinking a lot about things like you know, uh, like content. So thinking about um, you know, like this stream of topics coming from a lot of text or listening to a, a, a conversation, listening to voices and being able to extract something useful from that. 
but then beyond that, like with the example of blush, like the stream of topics is interesting, but it's that's a substrate. What do you build on top of that? What are the second order interactions that we can start to build that make that compelling? So bringing those online interests into an offline conversation then then gives me a context for that information. I always think of the Internet of Things as um, my mom's eyes in the back of her head. <laughs> she used to sort of know when you were doing something in the room that you shouldn't be doing, and, and she was always right. Uh, and I sort of hope that someday the Internet of Things plays that role a little bit for me. It, it's aware of things I, about myself that I'm not necessarily aware about, but it can be helpful to me if, if I can learn about them, if I can have that insight. Mm -hmm. Or one definition, let's put it that way, one benefit. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I think we, we're sort of running out of our, our time. Um, I would love to keep this conversation going. In fact, why don't you guys all come over for lunch? Uh, and uh, I thank everybody for, for participating. Uh, I, I just can't wait to continually see the beautiful things that you guys make. Uh, and I know if the Internet of Things is going to go on to create real value um, and poetry in our lives, it's going to be because of the incredible work that you guys and, and others like you do. So um, thank you for that and for participating. And uh, I encourage you to come back and join us for a weekly hangout on uh, this bat channel at this bat time uh, every week, every Wednesday, uh, and hope to see you guys at the Future Storytelling Summit in October. So. Um, thanks again, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Big, grand gesture at the end. <laughs> <laughs> very big, very big. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. Thank you.